imagine that we're observing a world that's more or less like ours. In this hypothetical world, however, there exists a mysterious cosmic lottery. This will be the basis of this imaginary scenario. Now, very little is known about this cosmic lottery, and I'm going to lay out a few points that will better define this. First, it's not directly known whether a winner is determined randomly or deliberately. This is despite the word lottery in the title. We just don't know. Secondly, it's entirely unknown how long this lottery has been going on or how often drawings have occurred or will occur. Thirdly, it's unknown how many participants are entered into or are eligible for this lottery. Fourthly, a winner is identified if, and only if, an individual meets the exact criteria for winning. Otherwise, nothing at all happens. This implies that no one's even aware that there's a cosmic lottery unless a winner has been identified. Finally, if a winner is identified, then the winning criteria is revealed. But it's not revealed how those criteria were established or formulated. As you can see, we know very little. With all these unknowns, is it any wonder why they call it mysterious? Anyway, given that, let's move forward with the scenario. Consider now that we are made aware of a winner, Roger. Since Roger has been identified as a winner, the winning criteria are revealed. Let's have a look at that list. Hmm. These criteria certainly seem ludicrous, don't they? Of course, the immediate and natural reaction is to think something like, Holy crap, Roger's impossibly lucky. I mean, even considering just one of those criteria, how improbable is it that he'd have eaten exactly 97.32 Tic Tacs? If that number was even the tiniest fraction different, then Roger could never have won. That's absurd, let alone meeting all of those ridiculous criteria simultaneously. There's just no way this can be random. There has to be some intent behind it. Maybe the Cosmic Lottery team wanted Roger to win and researched the criteria needed to make him the winner. But really, it just seems so improbable that it just can't be the result of a randomly determined process. Alright, so as I'm certain you're expecting, let's not be so hasty. There's actually plenty of reason to be skeptical of such conclusion despite the apparently staggeringly low probability of Roger's victory. Let's consider why exactly it is we're even looking at Roger in the first place. It's not that we're looking at Roger who is the winner, but rather that we're looking at the winner who is Roger. That seems nonsensical to say, right? Like I'm saying the same thing twice. Well, let me clarify this with a similar analogy. Let's say that one person out of, say, a pool of 100 people will be selected at random. If we were to consider a particular individual prior to the selection, then the probability of that individual winning is 1%. If we chose Susie, for instance, and Susie ultimately was the individual that was selected, then we will have certainly chosen Susie who is the winner. Certainly a decently improbable outcome. Now, let's suppose that after the selection, we consider the winner, Susie. The fact of the matter is that since we're considering the winner, we'd be considering someone else if Susie didn't win. Since there's a 100% chance that there will be some winner, there's a 100% chance that some individual will be selected, defying the low 1% chance. And since Susie happened to be the individual selected, it's the case that we're looking at the winner who is Susie. That should clearly illustrate the difference in the two statements I previously made. And if we were to increase the sample size from 100 people to 100 billion people, the same principle applies. Each individual stands a very low chance of being selected, but there's still a 100% chance that someone will be selected, again, defying the crazy odds. Returning to Roger, we should realize that we weren't considering Roger before he won, but rather we're considering whatever individual happened to be the winner. To reiterate, it's not that we're looking at Roger who is the winner, but rather that we're looking at the winner who is Roger. That should make a lot more sense now. Hold on a sec. The example that was just presented assumed a 100% chance of there being a winner, didn't it? How can we assume that there'd be a 100% chance that the Cosmic Lottery would have a winner? That's a good question, me with a comically distorted voice. You're right. We have no means of knowing that the Cosmic Lottery will 100% certainly produce a winner. The purpose of that example was to create a juxtaposition between two approaches to probability. A priori and a posteriori. 
which is essentially just to say that the probability is being calculated before or after the particular event, respectively. And here, we're already at a state in the scenario in which a winner does exist. So since we are actually considering an individual right now, this means that the event of there being a winner is 100%, since an already occurred event has a 100% probability to occur, which qualifies for the latter scenario a posteriori. All right, to elaborate this, probability is the likelihood of a particular event to occur, and it's a useful conceptual tool for navigating the unknown in order to make more accurate predictions of the future. Imagine that we're about to execute a coin flip with a fair coin. We'd say that the probability of the coin landing on heads is 50%, and the same with tails. But the fact of the matter is that the trajectory and final resting place of the coin is actually a matter of physics. And if the coin were flipped in the exact same way, under the same conditions, a thousand times, then the result would be heads a thousand times. The event isn't truly random, it's our ignorance of all the contributing factors that makes it so. If the event in question has already occurred, then there's no possibility whatsoever for it to not occur. Thus, an already occurred event has a 100% probability to occur following the moment it occurred. Now, we can certainly imagine back to a point when the result was not finalized yet, the event did not occur, and calculate the probability from there. With a coin, that's pretty easy because we assume a fair coin and there aren't any significant factors that favor one outcome over the other. Like if one side had a glob of rubber stuck to it, that would cause it to bounce more in favor of the other side, that would be an example. In order to accurately calculate the probability of a more complex event that's already occurred, we need to know all of the contributing factors that influence this particular outcome so we can determine what outcomes are actually possible. And the point in time that's selected from which to base the calculation is highly subjective and prone to fallacious reasoning. For example, consider my pants. Yeah, yeah, I know that's weird, but focus. From the standpoint of 100,000 years ago, what do you think the probability would be that all of these particular atoms that make up my pants today would end up together from wherever they were at that time to be in this precise location and configuration. It would end up being infinitesimally small and mathematically impossible. Yet, here they are. The point is that since there exists a winner in the cosmic lottery, right now, we know this event has a 100% probability of occurrence, but we have no basis whatsoever from which to calculate what the probability was at any prior time since we don't know any of the contributing factors. Now, let us move on. Let's look again at those criteria. Certainly, they're crazy and outlandishly precise, but the fact of the matter is that we don't know anything about the nature of those criteria. We don't know if those variables could be any different than what they are. We don't know how much they could be different. And we don't know if some of those criteria could be outright excluded. We just don't know. The only thing that we do know is that when we're looking at a winning individual, then there's a 100% chance that they precisely qualify for all of the conditions listed, because that's exactly what makes them a winner in the first place. And since we'd not be considering any individual at all if no one won, then if we're looking at any individual, there's a 100% chance that they meet all of those crazy criteria. See, our human intuition often causes us to extrapolate conclusions very hastily from available data even when that data is incomplete and there's not enough to validate any significant conclusion. Sometimes our intuition simply doesn't understand reality properly. Just for fun, here's another little scenario. Suppose you're on a game show and you're given the choice between three doors. Behind one door is a car. Behind the others, goats. You pick a door, say number one, and the host, who knows what's behind the doors, opens another door, say number three, which has a goat. He then says to you, do you want to pick door number two, or do you want to stay with your original selection? Is it to your advantage to switch your choice? The initial reaction is probably to consider that, since one goat was revealed, then one door has a car and one door has a goat, therefore it's a 50-50 chance and doesn't really matter. However, the extremely counterintuitive fact of the matter is that you're twice as likely to win the car if you opt to switch your choice. It's crazy, but it's true. This is what's known as the Monty Hall problem, and I left a link down in the description box and you can go explore this on your own. I'll leave you with that one.
The take home here is that this is a really good example of how your intuition about the probability of an event can be really askew from reality. Once again returning our focus to Roger, given how very little we know about this whole scenario, it's not possible to calculate or even loosely estimate any kind of probability. We'd only be able to do so if we had knowledge of how that criteria were formulated or if we had enough winners to form an adequate sample size to support a valid data set. Since we have neither of these, because only one winner has been identified, this means that any conclusion as to whether the cosmic lottery is random or not, or if it's fixed or not, is entirely unwarranted. We just don't have the required information. Now I'm sure anyone watching this has the wherewithal to see where this is going, especially given the video's title. The Cosmic Lottery is very strongly analogous to the fine-tuning argument, and it highlights the underlying fundamental problems. Allow me to clearly draw these parallels right now. The first point is pretty easy. It's not directly known whether the universe is random, i.e. exists without a driven intent, or designed. This is the entire point of the contemplation in the first place. If we had direct access to the information, then we wouldn't be discussing this. Points 2 and 3 are covered together. It's unknown how long this universe that we observe and exist in has been in existence, or if this is the only universe. This isn't to endorse the multiverse theory or anything, but we don't have any knowledge of any kind of alternate universe, or alternate possible states of existence. Nor do we know what the universe was like as we approach the beginning of the expansion as explained by the Big Bang Theory. Although it can be extrapolated from mathematical formulas and the known laws of physics that the universe existed in a singularity at one point, the known physical laws break down at the beginning of the universe. This means that it's impossible to know anything about the state of the universe prior to that point, or even if there was a prior to that point. I'm going to leave a few links in the description that cover this. As for the fourth condition, if a universe does not support life, which I mean in a more colloquial sense as consciousness and thought, then it's impossible for such contemplations to even exist. Conscious beings will only ever find themselves existing in a universe that permits the existence of consciousness in some capacity. This means that there can be no awareness of a universe unless that universe supports the existence of that awareness. So just like we're considering the winner in a lottery scenario, we're considering this universe that already supports life. As for the fifth condition, if a universe hosts conscious beings, then those beings can examine and explore the parameters of the universe in which they exist, aka the physical laws. And this is precisely where the crux of the fine-tuning argument lies. I'm going to read a little bit from a website. If the initial explosion of the Big Bang had differed in the strength by as little as one part in 1060, the universe would have either quickly collapsed back onto itself or expanded too rapidly for the stars to form. In either case, life would be impossible. And as you can see, they list just a few of the many, many constants that if they were any different in even the slightest degree, the universe could not exist as we observe it. This is strongly analogous to the criteria of the Cosmic Lottery. If any of those criteria had even been slightly different, then Roger couldn't have won. He wouldn't have qualified. And even if millions upon millions of people were eligible for this lottery, it would be mathematically impossible that any other individual would meet these incredibly precise criteria. And this is where our lack of knowledge prevents us from reaching any valid conclusion about the design of the universe. While it can be calculated that this universe couldn't come to exist if the physical laws we observe are tweaked even in the slightest. We don't even know if those physical laws could be different, we don't know how they could be different, and we don't know of any other configurations in which a life-sustaining universe might be possible. Further, we don't know if any of these laws are necessary in a universe. We don't know if there are additional laws that we have no awareness of that would constitute a functional universe. A good example of a universe or world that's totally divorced of physical laws is a spiritual realm. In fact, it's something that most people believe in who hold the fine-tuning argument to be plausible. A purely spiritual world, which we can only speculate on obviously, would support consciousness in spite of the physical laws being completely different than they are now or absent. So, in conclusion, the fine-tuning argument takes advantage of the flawed human intuition about the probability of events 
and twists it to reach the conclusion that the universe must be designed. Despite this strong feeling though, this does not reflect reality because, as said multiple times, we simply don't have the information required to reach such conclusions. As illustrated by the cosmic lottery scenario, we would need extensive knowledge of all the contributing factors to the existence of this particular universe, or we would need a significant sample size, much, much greater than the one universe we have to observe right now. And to be abundantly clear, this is not to say that the universe is absolutely not designed. That conclusion is just as invalid. So I hope you found it interesting, and please leave comments if you have any, and I'm sure you will. Thank you very much for listening.